Well done for hanging in there. Um, of course, as you would expect, you know, uh, people are slowly sort of uh, falling way by the wayside, kind of one by one. Um, I have a little gift for most of you, which means that sort of there are more people here than I have gifts. So kind of be generous and then either give it to yourself or to somebody else, to your neighbor, which is this little uh, magazine called Inc., so Tyndale House Inc. There is a box to the left of the door on the ground that has, I think, 40 copies of it. It's, uh, it, it's a good showcase of the type of thing we are doing in Tyndale House Cambridge, the type of uh, biblical research we, we try to encourage and we will try, uh, w w we're trying to, to get out to the church there. Um, at the door, there is a little card that says, Tyndale House, your invitation to study. So you can come to us if you are you know, either involved in biblical research of some sort to spend some weeks or months or years uh, at Tyndale House with us. Uh, you don't need to do, be working on a degree as such. I mean, we, are, we are blessed by many pastors who come for shorter or longer time and either working on a sermon series or just have a sabbatical and use that time to read up, you know, just to, to be in an environment where you are expected to read and where you have a good coffee time, uh, coffee time conversations. So you're welcome there. And in that same box where the ink is, there are also some little leaflets that tells you, tell you about what Tyndale House actually sets out to do. We are not a training institution, so we don't prepare anyone for ministry, but we try to be a influence for good within the whole field of biblical studies. Okay, that by way of introduction, which means that I can leave that there. Our third and final uh, talk this afternoon, uh, talking about the written Gospels and about that mechanism of how do we get from, uh, from taught uh, version of the words of Jesus to a written version. Um, now, what we have done Again, I like to repeat so that we all get the basic message to, to get home. Um, we have painted a picture of the apostles, not only teaching the words of Jesus, but also using his words in their writings. And of course, the implication for us is that we ought to read the letters of the New Testament with the words of Jesus in mind, because that was how they were written and read in the first place. And we have seen that this situation resonates well with the nature of the new covenant in which, in which God would write his word on the hearts of people. And Jesus explained that this would happen through the Holy Spirit. Which leads us to a question, why did we still end up with a written New Testament? If the Holy Spirit is the one writing God's words on our hearts, why do we need a Bible at all? What is the reason that at some point the gospel was written down, and not just once, but even four times? No, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, true to our method we have used so far, we will think about this question by means of tracing biblical history itself, by following what happened on the ground as the church grew, and, of course, equally important, the apostles got older. Uh, so, we will basically have uh, four headings this afternoon. Uh, the question, how will the church fare after I have gone? Then we're going to have a look at references to the written Gospels in the New Testament. Are there any? And then we are going to talk about the whole issue of the written text of the oral traditions. How should we read? Question mark. Well, there's something to be said. And then we are going to get through, as time permits, uh, some examples how we could read the Gospels uh, in a bit of a larger context than just as individual uh, stories kind of string, strung together. 
Um, so let's start with that first question. How, no, how will the church fare after I have gone? Why, uh, why w was stuff written down? Now, there are a number of letters in the New Testament that are very specific, and they are written for a particular context. And often what we find in those letters is that the author uses the letter to make up for his personal absence. So, no, the author says, I would rather be there myself, but instead I'm writing this letter to you. For example, in uh, 2 John, it's not a letter that is being read or preached too often, but at least it does better than 3 John. Um, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, or the Greek says mouth to mouth, so that our joy may be complete. Now, 2 John is, of course, a very short letter. And John expresses his desire to share much more with his recipients than he actually does. But there is the promise that all these things will be dealt with once John will visit them. Because in sharing these things face to face, mouth to mouth, their joy will be complete. I mean, Communication by letter is a good and a useful thing, but seeing one another in real life is better. And you find the same, for example, in 2 Timothy uh, 1.4. Now, this does not take away from the notion that also the letters function to complete their joy, to make their joy complete. Because so much is already clear in one John where the same John says, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So even though he says in 2 John, I hope to see you face to face so that our joy may be complete, in 1 John it is, well, I, I write these things so that our joy may be complete. Um, how do we bring these things together? No. Um, well, Jesus used the same term about you know, the joy being made complete. Um, Jesus, uh, when, he, when, when he was on earth, before he was going to the Father, he says, no, I am going to the Father so that the joy of you disciples will be complete. So in John, we find both thoughts living side by side. Joy is made full of be complete by means of letters, but also by means of personal presence. So which of the two is it? John, come on, make up your mind. Is almost How is it possible to keep this apparent contradiction intact? Well, the answer lies in the source of that expression, complete joy, or joy being made full, or perhaps better known to us in the expression, fullness of joy, which is basically, no, complete joy. Um, and in, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, those things actually overlap perfectly. Um, what do you think, for example, about Psalm 16, verse 11? In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Now, and this gives us the overarching concept of understanding all the references that John makes of fullness of joy. Because when John is looking forward to see you know, the people face to face so that the fullness of joy will be complete, it is because they will see their Lord and Savior in one another. I mean, the greatest thing about seeing old friends where you have you know, both walked with the Lord for years and years and after some time you see one another again, what is the joy? You see God's work in one another. And that is the fullness of joy. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Irrespective of the means by which God is communicated, by letter or personal presence, before God there is fullness of joy 
there is that fellowship. Well, then, this is uh, typically the language of uh, John. Paul says more or less the same in 1 Thessalonians. Um, there, the letter is almost a poor substitute of his personal presence. Those are my words, not Paul's. Um, this tension we find here in 1 Thessalonians. Paul wrote this letter quite shortly after he had left Thessalonica. Uh, it was probably only a matter of months after his visit. And throughout this letter, Paul talks openly about his desire to see the Thessalonians. No? We endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face because we wanted to come to you. So, you know, see that sort of uh, culmination of, uh, of language here, the more eagerly and with great desire. So he, he uses a variety of terms just to express the magnitude of his desire to come and see them. Uh, but it is Satan that hinders him. He cannot come back. So Paul sends this letter to encourage the church after Timothy's visit to them. And Timothy acted as a substitute for a visit by Paul himself. Now, the apostle reminds the church of the teaching and instruction they had already received. He says at the beginning of uh, chapter 4, As you received from us how you ought to live and to please God just as you are doing. And also... Uh, some parts of this letter are simply there to encourage, to continue what they are doing already. For example, in chapter 4, verse 9, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. Uh, because they were expressing that brotherly love. And just as he says in chapter 5, in the middle of that text about uh, the coming of the Lord. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Now, there are things just for affirmation, for confirmation, rather than giving new uh, information. But despite the limitations of the letter, and despite Paul's desire to be there rather than write a letter, um, the letter does contain Paul's apostolic voice. No? It carries his authority. And that is made clear in the penultimate verse of 1 Thessalonians. No? I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Now that's quite strong, strong language. No? I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. Why? Because this letter is Paul's authoritative apostolic teaching. Even though he wished to be there personally in order to, to share all this and to confirm their faith and to encourage their growth, etc., he has to use the letter instead, but he is fully aware that this letter is important and you know, tells the church what they are supposed to learn. Um, now then there is the little thing uh, that this notion that a letter can carry the apostolic voice was not new to Paul. Paul did not invent this. It was already more or less decided that this could be the case back in Acts 15, where we have the council in Jerusalem when there were brothers who preached that also you know, the Gentiles needed to be circumcised and the matter was brought to, to the apostolic council in Jerusalem and a decision was made that of course Gentiles do not need to be circumcised and then the apostles and the elders write a letter. Um, and that letter in Acts 15 starts like this. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria, Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Um, and then the decree is mentioned, basically what has been decided, uh, what has been confirmed. And then the letter says, 
We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. There was the apostolic letter that carried the apostolic authority, but here it was confirmed by secondary means, namely some people who were sent with the letter who would tell them the same thing. So the letters were confirmed by the personal uh, attestation of the people who carried the, the letter. Um, then we go one step further, because this, this was just a minor point from uh, Acts 15. And by the way, even in the Old Testament, we already see that, for example, the prophetic voice, prophetic authority could be carried by letter. For example, that letter that Jeremiah sent to the exiles in, in Babylon. And that is the sort of closest parallel for using a letter to project the voice either of a prophet or apostle beyond, uh, beyond direct uh, listeners. But then we come to uh, Colossians. Because when Thessalonians was written, the church was still reasonably young. And from Acts, we learn that Paul had visited and revisited many of the churches that had come into existence. Now, of course, these personal visits became increasingly more difficult when the gospel spread. Though the letter of Romans was written to a church that Paul had not founded, the apostle still envisages that he would see them quite soon. That is uh, what he says in chapter 1 and again at the, in chapter 15. When we turn to the letter to the Colossians, Paul admits that a personal visit is unlikely. No? He has learned about the state of the church from Epaphras in Colossians 1.8, and Paul makes clear that Epaphras has his full support. And Paul then comes to talk about his own ministry, how he warns and teaches everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ, Colossians 1.27. Now, that Paul is quite conscious of the implications of the word everyone becomes clear in what follows, follows. because Paul toils and struggles for the Colossians as well, who he will not see face to face. Uh, he says in chapter 2, verse 1, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Now, I want these words to, to let sink in a, a little bit. No? Paul's goal for all those who ha he has not seen is that they may become mature in Christ. Christ who is the source of all knowledge and wisdom. And this leads automatically to the question, how is Paul struggling for those who have not seen him face to face? Uh, well, it certainly does include Paul's prayers for them. In chapter 1, he already has shared that Paul is remembering their faith in all his prayers. And also in chapter 4 of Colossians, it is Epaphras who is struggling for the church in prayer. So part of this struggle of Paul for those who have not seen him face to face is certainly part of his prayer life. Um, but Paul's prayers do not exhaust the meaning of the struggle. Because Paul's message in this letter is the supremacy of Christ in old and new creation in whom are hidden all treasures of knowledge and wisdom and the letter itself functions to achieve the goal uh, of what Paul is struggling for. 
Paul is struggling to, so that they are all mature in Christ. And what is he writing to them? I say something, how Christ is supreme and how he became, can become everything in your own life. Um, so the letter itself is in that sense part of Paul's struggle for all those who have not seen him face to face. The apostolic letters are part of the strategy to knit the church together in love. That is Colossians 2, 2 3. Um, and from here, it is only a small step to what Paul says at the end of this uh, letter. When this letter has been read among you, uh, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. I mean, Paul wants the churches of Colossae and Laodicea to be in contact with one another. No, they need to be united in love. And Paul gives them a good reason to be in contact, namely to exchange Paul's letters they have received. Now, Paul could have added simply a copy of the Laodicean letter to that of Colossae. Um, but instead, he prefers the churches to do this uh, as an act of fellowship. Now, you give good reason to, to exchange something. Yet, also the letters themselves function to reinforce the bond of these churches. The shared contact, uh, sorry, the sharing of the content of these letters unites people around a single message. So by sharing the letter, by writing, by sharing these letters, Paul achieves his, his goal of presenting everyone mature before Christ. They are sharing the same apostolic teaching about the exalted Christ. Now, Paul's strategy to unite the churches that have not seen him face to face and by implication also those churches who will never see him face to face, is to have him united around the shared apostolic teaching that has come to them by means of the written letter. And we should not underestimate how momentous this shift is in the course of the early church. No longer is it the personal relationship to the apostles, either directly or indirectly by means of an intermediary such as Epaphras, but now the letters that Paul has sent take over at least some of that cre uh, fellowship-creating function. The struggle of Paul for those he has not seen is in part solved by sending and sharing the letters he has sent. So that's Paul in Colossians. Um, what about Peter? Well, let's go to 2 Peter. I mean, we could return to 1 John and the emphasis in that letter that you know, what the apostle writes is to encourage and establish the fellowship and complete the joy by sharing. But let's go to 2 Peter. Arguably one of the latest letters found in the New Testament. And Peter sets out the circumstances that are there and the presenting problem in verse 12. Um, he basically says, I intend always to remind you of these qualities about which he had just written, though you know them, and are established in the truth that you have. So Peter cares about the continuity of his teaching. He uses the term always. And he follows this up by saying he will stir up his audience to continue in this teaching as long as he is alive. But since Peter is facing his death, as Jesus had announced it to him a long time ago, he realizes that there will be a time he cannot do this any longer. What does he say? And I will make every effort 
so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. And that's an interesting way of you know, describing the, uh, the solution. What is Peter's solution for the church after his death? Well, he will give them a means, a medium, by which they are able always to recall these things. What could that be? Um, interestingly, Peter does not solve this by publicly endorsing the next generation of teachers. He could have done that, but Paul does, Peter does not say, look at my successes. This letter does not endorse any name of the followers of the first generation of apostles. I mean, by pointing out the problem in a letter, by writing about the permanence of Peter's teaching also after his death, of course, Peter is supplying the solution as he is writing. Basically describing the problem, I want you to remember these things all well, so after my death, is solving the problem. Because now they can remember these things after his death, because he had just written them down. Asking the question in a letter is in this case identical to answering it. This letter, Peter's second, is part of his legacy. And this letter provides the means to keep his teaching alive also after his death. Now, of course, this letter does not contain Peter's teaching about a life and death and resurrection of Jesus. But it is aware of the problem of continuing the teaching also after his passing. And the solution is to entrust his teaching to paper. Now, as said, Peter does not endorse any of the second generation followers of Jesus. However, Peter does mention a single contemporary, namely the Apostle Paul. Without going to unpack the whole passage, uh, it suffices for our purposes that Peter endorses the writings of the Apostle Paul as he knew them, apparently as a collection. And by implication, these writings were not just known to Peter, but also accessible to Peter's audience. So what does Peter say? Well, just as our be uh, brother, beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him. So, first of all, Peter mentions that Paul had written to the same audience. Uh, elsewhere, I, I, I have explained how the audience of two Peter is the same as the audience of one Peter, and that one Peter describes the region of where Peter's readers are, which is indeed the region to which Paul had written, for example, Galatians and Colossians and a couple of other letters. So we're talking about identifiable letters, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you. Then Peter adds in verse 16, as he does in all his letters. So not just the letters that were written to the churches in the same region, but in all his letters. So by this time, Peter knew about a collection of Paul's letters that could have been sort of uh, you know, designated as all his letters, to which Peter had access to, he had knowledge of these letters, but also the churches to which he wrote had access to this collection of letters. Um, by the end of the apostolic era, by the end of the lives of the apostles, they make clear that the authority of the apostolic teaching lies in their writings. And though we do not find an explicit endorsement of the written gospels, 
The notion that the apostolic authority would continue in writing is then well established by the end. So let's go then to our next point for this afternoon. Are there references to the written Gospels in the New Testament? Um, that, that, that's an interesting one. I think it, at least it's interesting. I thought it was interesting when, when, I, uh, when I sort of thought the question. Are, are, are the Gospels referred to in any, any way? Um, because now we have seen that there is a distinct move towards writing down apostolic teaching. Um, do we find any reference to the written form of the gospel? So not just teaching of Jesus, but explicitly that something is written down. Um, because after all, the gospels give us what the eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have handed down. Um, well, we have seen how the opening of the Gospel of Luke refers to many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. So Luke tells us explicitly that he is not the first to write the handed down teaching as an audit account. Um, well, at least it's worthwhile to mention John, the, gospel, the end of the Gospel of John, because John's Gospel is very much aware that people will encounter it in written form. Now, it is a book, it is a written testimony. And it says about itself in, in John 20, 30, uh, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. So it is self-referential here. It is a book that is written and John is very much aware of it. Um, John does not refer to other books, but he is mentioned at least explicitly, he is writing a book. And this is, for example, unlike what we find in the Gospel of Mark, Mark is not particularly open in its sort of book awareness. It. Mark, uh, the Gospel of Mark, is, is not being uh, sort of gives us the information that this is a book. Because when it says, no, the Gospel of Jesus Christ, Son of God, then the Gospel is there still very much used in term of message rather than a Gospel book. And throughout the New Testament, the word Gospel normally refers to message and not to a written book. But of course, we know the Gospel as Gospel books and also know the gospel as something that is preached, so we can live with, with, with both meanings. Um, and uh, John says, of course, a chapter later about uh, the teaching of Jesus, were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, I don't think that this, uh, this closing statement can be seen as hard evidence that John knew of other written Gospels. Because John does not say this explicitly. By implications, it might, but it is a little bit you say, I say type of, of thing. It, it might be, but it is, uh, you can take it either way. But what he does make clear is that there are many more stories of Jesus to tell. So many that it is definitely more than four books full of stories of Jesus. So even in, in that sense, uh, we get some information. Now then there is a reference possibly to, uh, to uh, the written Gospels, in 2 Corinthians 8. Now, I don't think it is, so let me be clear. I don't think this is a reference to the written gospel, um, but it is often presented as a possibility. Yeah? So, so don't, don't walk away and say, no, Dirk Jonkent is teaching that 2 Corinthians 8 is a reference to the written gospel, but it is often said about it. And it is said by uh, very esteemed people, uh, for example, Chris Ostom in the fourth century already. Oh, his Greek was better than mine in, in many ways because no, he, he preached in, in, in Greek the whole time. But, but still, I don't think he, he, he is right there. And Paul 
tells the Corinthians that uh, oh, with him we are the brother who is famous among all the churches. Forget about the for his preaching, but what it says in the Greek, who is famous among all the churches in the gospel or for the gospel. And this is often interpreted as Paul gives a reference to Luke here. Luke, who is, of course, that close associates uh, with Paul. And Paul says, no, that Luke is known for his gospel. But first of all, I doubt it uh, because there is little positive evidence in the text that points, first of all, to Luke. At best, there is circumstantial evidence that it might be Luke. So you can make an argument that it is possible that Luke is there because no kind of he had motive, he uh, had the occasion to, it's, it's a traditional murder mystery type of, of, of thing. Uh, it could be Luke, but there is little positive evidence in the text that drives you towards Luke. Um, but secondly, oh, well, wait a minute, and, and in order to, to make that case for Luke, for example, we had that instance in 1 Corinthians that Paul cites the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as they appear in Luke's Gospel. Uh, and there is that thing in 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul mentions all the resurrection appearances of Jesus. Uh, Paul mentions that, and he appeared to Peter and to James and to all the apostles. Now that Jesus appeared to Peter on his own is only mentioned in Luke 24, and even there only indirectly. So where... Uh, where the, the uh, people, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, come back you know, in the middle of, of the night, meet all the other disciples who are, are gathered there, and they say, the disciples who are already there, there's a bit of a textual variant going on, but not going there, uh, say, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. So it is only Luke 24 that mentions a personal appearance of the risen Lord Jesus to Peter, and it is also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15. So that's one of those tiny links between Paul and, and Luke. Um, but I don't think it is sufficient to establish that therefore Paul is a, uh, pointing at Luke and to his written gospel. Um, because the term, no, he is famous in the gospel might refer to a gospel account, but it is perhaps better explained as it is translated that it is mean no gospel in the sense of gospel work, the actual work of doing the gospel, because that is how Paul uses the terms earlier in 2 Corinthians in chapter 2, 12, where he says, when I came to Troas to preach well, to preach the gospel of Christ, he says, when I came to tro Troas, in the gospel of Christ. And almost the same expression as uh, later used in 2 Corinthians 8. So I don't think it's likely that Paul refers to Luke as the author of the gospel, as Paul never uses the term gospel for the written version of the message. For Paul, gospel always means the message of Jesus. But I am open to the option that this particular brother, who is famous in the gospel, may have been famous for his particular way of teaching the gospel story. Because he must have been famous for something. Now, and it is something to do with gospel preaching. That is very well possible. And it may have been a brother who has been particularly gifted with presenting the gospel story to the churches. 
And that might very well have been Luke who would write it down after a couple of years. But that is as far as we can push the envelope without starting to speculate. Uh, so it's not a reference to the written Gospels. Um, there are two places where I cannot exclude that written Gospel books are included into a bigger category. Though neither we have very many positive reasons to do so. But they're still worth our time because they help us to read freshly. And I think that that's always worthwhile. The first one is in Romans 16, verse 25 to 26. Where Paul talks about the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Now, the Greek here lacks an article with the expression prophetic writings. So, in Greek, it would re read, uh, has now been disclosed and through prophetic writings been made known to all nations. And it bothers me a little, the absence of the article here. I mean, the traditional understanding of these words is that there was a mystery hidden already in the Old Testament, but now, with the benefit of a proper understanding, these Old Testament scriptures are now used to bring to light the mystery to the nations. And since you know, Romans makes ample use of the Old Testament to unpack the meaning of justification by faith, Paul is simply referring to the existing scriptures that now proclaim the mystery. And indeed, there's nothing objectionable or wrong with these thoughts. But I'm not sure this is what Paul intends to say. What bothers me is the absence of the article before prophetic writings. If Paul had been referring to the scriptures he had been using all the time, I would have expected the expression, the prophetic writings, because those are the prophetic writings already activated in the context of, of Romans. If we give full weight to the absence of the article, then what Paul may be saying is that now, now, through prophetic writings, the mystery is made known to, to the nations. What are these prophetic writings? Well, for example, perhaps the very thing we are reading here, the letter to the Romans, is a prophetic word explaining to the nations how the mystery has been revealed. But perhaps more specifically, Paul could be referring to those writings that proclaim the message that demands obedience, namely the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul might very well be referring to written gospels. Now, I do not think we can solve the problem. The text, I don't think the text gives us sufficient information here. But at the very least, we should build in the possibility that Paul may be referring here to writings that are written under the New Covenant. Now, similarly, the next one, the similar uncertainty we have in the, uh, at the end of 2 Peter. I mean, we have already seen how Peter refers to not a few, but all of Paul's letters. And then he warns against the unstable people who twist Paul's letters. And he says about Paul's letters, there are some things in them that are hard to understand. And here he shows you the brilliance of being an apostle. Because he can read Paul and say, there are only some things I don't understand. Or some things that are hard to understand. Well, on average, you know, there's so much that is hard. But, but 
Peter had an advantage here. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So, what are the other scriptures Peter is talking about? Now, our standard answer is the other scriptures are the scriptures of the Old Testament. And again, there is nothing wrong to this explanation. But I would like to ask, why do we restrict the expression to the Old Testament? I mean, could Peter also include scriptures written under the New Covenant, such as the Gospels? After all, to Peter is probably one of the last letters written. Gospels may well have been in existence already and included in all the other scriptures that are being twisted. Again, I can do little more than raise the possibility the text is not specific enough. Now, there are two clearer examples to the written Gospels that come from outside the actual Gospels. And the first is the most obvious one, and I had almost forgotten this one, um, uh, except that our, uh, our financial person at Tyndale House, when we were talking about this thing, I was talking, I'm going to the Netherlands to talk about these things, and talking about external reference to the Gospel, she came up immediately with, oh, that's this one. Oh, never thought about it. We'll see. This is namely the one in Acts 1, where, uh, no, look right, in the first book, O Theophilus, I've dealt with all that Jesus began to teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Of course, this is outside the Gospels, and it is a clear reference to one of the Gospels, namely Luke. So we won't spend more time on this, but it needs to be included. The second reference is more contentious, but I still think that the balance of probability comes firmly down to the notion that we have a genuine reference to a written Gospel. And that is what we find in 1 Timothy 5, 8, where we have... Oh, uh, Paul writing, for scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain and the laborer is worth, deserves his wages. Now, the first citation, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, is obviously from Deuteronomy uh, 25. 25 verse 4, you shall not muzzle an ox when it's treading out the grain. So, nothing wrong there. But what about the second? The laborer deserves his wages. Uh, well, let's expand a little bit, by the way, because Paul had used this citation, you shall not muzzle an ox, already in 1 Corinthians 9. 9. So, so, it's interesting that he uses the same kind of citation twice. Um, and I think, I think that is quite apparent because I have used some citations already three or four times in one single day. So uh, it's not strange to uh, refer back to the same thing. But then, of course, it's the second one. The laborer deserves his wages. And there's only one place where we find these words, and that's in Luke chapter 10. If you are reading the ESV with sort of side notes, the ESV will refer you to Matthew, Matthew 10.10. 10. But that's not where you find these words. Uh, it comes close, but it's not exact. But the exact words we find, of course, I would say, in the Gospel of Luke, because it's the Paul-Luke connection coming up again, um, where Jesus actually says... Uh, no, uh, to, to, to his disciples, uh, remain in the same house when you preach the gospel, eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. Um, right, so um, you could take this reference as Scripture says, 
as introducing only the first of these two. And that is quite often the wriggle room that, that, that's provided. Um, because the second quotation is only introduced with and, and the reader is supposed to understand then, okay, that it's not a reference to scripture, but to the words of Jesus, which by this time are of course taught and remembered and not yet written down. I still think that when Paul starts with scripture says, he intends that scripture covers both citation. Even though the words of Jesus are so well known that they would have been picked up as a reference anyway. So that is the sort of uh, the gray factor here. But I think that uh, it's more likely that scripture covers both. Which means that we have here a reference in one of Paul's later letters to something that is by then, by the writing of 1 Timothy, referred to as the writings, as scripture, without distinguishing between a level of authority between what is written in the Gospel of Luke and the scriptures of Deuteronomy. So now we have traced the whole story of the words of Jesus through the history of the New Testament, because this is roughly where the testimony of the New Testament to the coming into being of the Gospels finishes. We have seen how the words of Jesus were taught by the apostles who received the Holy Spirit as a helper to remind them of everything Jesus had said and done. And then we saw how the words of Jesus are constantly present when the letters were written. And how else could it be? I mean, the apostles preached Christ and his words and deeds, his commands. Uh, and they are all direct revelation of the Son of God. And since the apostles were Christ-filled, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was very high on their agenda. It was to be expected that his words would affect how the apostles wrote to the churches. And these churches had access to the content of the gospel as well. Initially, not in the form of written books, but in the form of traditions they were taught and which they maintained, just as Paul or any of the other eyewitnesses and ministers of the word had delivered to them. But then the apostles were faced with two issues, and they called these issues struggles. One was that they only could only be at one place at a time. The other, that they had only limited time and would die after they had run their course. How could those that had not seen them face to face still have access to the apostolic teaching? What would happen to the church after they died? Neither Paul or Peter appointed a successor. Though they had trusted people they worked with, they did not solve their spatial and temporal limitations by means of setting up a system of apostolic succession. Instead, they refer to one another's letters and possibly even to the whole set of prophetic writings that had been generated by and under the apostles. And this brings us to the theme of our study so far. How should we read the written word?